Good afternoon, everybody. In the interest of starting on time and trying to keep on time, um, we're going to go ahead and get started with the afternoon session. And we're going to start out by hearing from Joel Gittleson. Joel is a professor at the School of Public Health, and he's going to be talking about local policies and programs to improve the food system. And then we're going to hear from three panelists. Our one panelist is still driving from Delaware, which apparently got a lot more snow than we did down here. So hopefully he will be here on time. If not, we have a, someone else who's going to help out. But we're going to hear from Holly Freestadt, who is the Food Policy Director for Baltimore City, Liz Marchetta, who is the Food and Nutrition Services Director for the City Schools, and Anthony Francis, who's a Resident Food Equity Advisor for the Baltimore Food Policy Initiative. Before we get started, I want to give a shout out, and I don't even think he's here now, but I think it's safe to say that were it not for Dr. Sharfstein um, 11 years ago, you know, calling us up in a meeting saying, you guys need to get together, none of this work would be happening in Baltimore City, and certainly none of it would be happening in the level of integration and from what we consider kind of a local food systems perspective that it is right now. And um, Dr. Sharfstein was the health commissioner for Baltimore City at the time. He invited um, one of our doctoral students to do a presentation who had done a study looking at dietary outcomes and health, uh, where people live and uh, cardiovascular disease. And after, upon seeing that, said to the student, you need to get the health department together and the planning department together and you guys and whoever community partners you have out there. And Joel was part of this group too and said, you need to have a meeting and start talking about this because this needs to go across sectors. And so we took those marching orders seriously and now here we are 11 and a half years later with I think one of the most sophisticated uh, local food systems programs in the country in Baltimore City. It, was, it resides right here in Baltimore City. So I'm gonna stop there. So I guess we have to thank him, but he's not in the room right now, so we'll see if he comes back in later on. And I'm going to turn it over to Joel, who's going to talk for about 25 minutes about some local food policy innovations. Thank you, Anne. I'm really pleased to be here today and to have the opportunity to speak on this topic. Um, I'm going to, well, we've heard a lot of talk of actually about conceptualizing food systems. I'm going to talk a bit about conceptualizing local food systems and especially folk with a focus and emphasis on our city right here, Baltimore. And then I'll talk about approaches for intervening in local food systems. Again, provide a few case studies um, that might have some um, interesting lessons to share with us. And again, focusing on Baltimore. And then talk a bit about some opportunities, challenges, and future directions of this work. So um, just a few general comments. Many of these have been said by other speakers before. If we're thinking about food systems, uh, one aspect of which of these is that they are multi-level. We can move all the way from producers to wholesalers, distributors, food sources, households, uh, and all the way to uh, the individual level. But it's also important to realize that these are multi-component as well as multi-level. In other words, there are multiple units that operate at the same level. So again, taking our picture of Baltimore, and if we expand it, we see there's actually about 505 corner stores in Baltimore, about 264 convenience stores, 64 supermarkets, six public markets, 19 urban farms, 225 food pantries, Back up to wholesalers, six or eight, depending on how you count wholesalers. It's actually quite a complex um, food system here. And no two of these are exactly the same. Every corner store has a different story, has a different owner, and so forth. There are also dollar stores. There are pharmacies. This is often included in the count of, um, of convenience stores. But these are a diff additional types of, of venues that we could consider working with when we're trying to describe the food system here. The other, another aspect of this picture, and again taking Baltimore as an example, is that these different levels and this different, this complexity or number of units at each level is something that is um, deeply interrelated with each other. Um, each of these units influence each other in a nonlinear fashion with many interdependencies and feedback loops. And so, um, in my image here, I'm showing that there's this feedback. It's not just a flow of food from suppliers or wholesalers or producers 
down to uh, individuals, there's also some sort of feedback that's going in the other direction. And then, of course, there are many more aspects to the food system that we would, might want to consider, especially in the Baltimore circumstance. This is not going to be a complete listing at all, but uh, we could consider participation or the existence of food assistance programs. We could consider, as Shriki mentioned, marketing as an important component of um, the food system as well. And there are many other aspects. So I've mentioned a few key features of uh, food systems and local food systems. I think what I'm trying to illustrate by giving this specificity of Baltimore is that there are no two local food systems are exactly the same. They're all quite different from each other. And this means that there's no optimal intervention or set of interventions or policies that are appropriate for all local food systems. They actually, in my view, have to be developed um, through a community engagement process at each, um, in each um, venue. So what does it mean to work with local food systems? What, what are some of the approaches that we would take? Um, well, at the very least, we need to understand the local food system. Where are the weak points? Where are places where things are not flowing the way we want, where food is not getting to where we want it to get to, or where healthier food is not flowing to where we want it to get to? And I'm going to speak a little bit more about this, this flow of foods that are represented by the, the red X's in a moment. It's also important to think about the importance of community engagement. Again, as we heard from Christina Economos, um, in terms of the process that she's pioneering in terms of engaging with communities and community food systems to affect these kinds of changes. But we need to think about a community engagement in the initiation, design, implementation, evaluation, sustainability, and dissemination of food system interventions. We also have to know, and this is something that I'm very big on, is that when we say community, we're not just referring to the people who live in the community. In fact, we're referring to the people who supply the community. They may or may not live in the community. They, and these suppliers are at all different levels. And a, a point I think that uh, Bill Dietz mentioned that I want to underscore is that there's no such thing as food in general, right? There's specific types of foods, there's specific types of beverages, and they differ greatly. And so some foods, they vary in terms of perishability, where you get them, the risk or the profit margin that exists. And as we begin to conceptualize and think about interventions to improve the food system or the local food system, we need to consider this. So take, for example, a, uh, the situation or the setting of Baltimore and an illustration of the fact that I believe that uh, the type of food matters. So if we're talking about chips, and we're talking about the distribution of food from wholesalers or distributors to corner stores, there is, or, and if we're talk, comparing that with fresh produce, and we're talking about the distribution of fresh produce from wholesalers or distributors, there's actually very different um, feedback loops that exist here. So the supply from wholesalers to distributors is strong. It's robust, it's, it's powerful, and um, you will see um, delivery vehicles coming around um, delivering these, these products. And unfortunately, um, it's the potato chips, it's the soda, it's the ice cream and so forth um, that is in strong supply. And this is reinforced by a, and if you talk to the store owners, um, a very strong perception that there is a strong and a great demand for these foods. On the other hand, if we're talking about um, the supply of fresh produce or others, many other kinds of healthier foods, the supply chain is weak. There is no direct de delivery that, uh, that exists, um, at least not in the volumes that are required for delivery. And the perception that reinforces this, um, this lack of, of supply is a perceived weak demand. What's going on? Um, in corner stores and with wholesalers and their distributors, there are often formal and informal agreements that exist for these products. The, they may be incentivized with cash or price reductions, um, with uh, free display racks and that sort of thing, free delivery or other kinds of incentives. There's that, that, that reinforces this loop. At the other, at the other side of the, um, the spectrum, um, it's costly, or there are, no, there are no delivery services, perhaps, for produce or other kinds of healthier foods, or there may be minimum purchase requirements. And so at, 
that the Baltimore food system, and I would argue this is probably true in many low-income urban settings, um, the, were set up for failure or set up for challenges at least to be able to intervene to improve the food environment with the kinds of foods that we want to, to uh, supply. So um, how do we begin to address these challenges? Um, as I was be preparing this um, presentation, I happened upon the Healthy Food Policy Project website, which um, de describes 240 policies around the country. And I said, wow, this is a fabulous resource. I recommend that you all um, use it. And, um, and then I realized that there was no way that I was going to be able to summarize these 240 um, case examples and so forth for you. But there is a, cu a couple of things that I did want to pull out of that, um, that database. And um, first of all, if you look at the far right-hand side, it's sort of their rubric, their way of thinking about different types of policies or interventions to improve the food system. They define them as grow things that assist with growing or producing healthier foods, processing and packaging, distribution, the access that individuals may have, their preparation of those foods, and what, what do you do about the supply or waste of those foods? So in Baltimore City, we've adopted or addressing some of these different um, approaches. Um, I'm going to say a few more words about the urban farm tax credit that was adopted uh, several years ago in Baltimore City. Um, the beverage container tax that actually has been around for at least, was it, has it been a decade? I think it's been a fairly long period of time. Um, and um, the newly passed, um, um, and I think it's still yet to be put into effect, sugar sweetened beverage warning label. And these are all approaches that are currently being um, utilized in Baltimore, and they're addressing different layers of the food system. So again, using this rubric that emerges from this Healthy Food Policy website, um, a case, the first case that I would mention is the Baltimore Urban Farm Tax Credit. And um, in 2014, the state of Maryland updated its tax code to allow for tax credits for urban agriculture. And about a year later, uh, the city council enacted legislation to implement this kind of tax credit in Baltimore City, which basically gives owners of vacant lots uh, about 90% off of their property taxes um, if they convert that to uh, urban agricultural use. And um, this reflects a variety of different strategies um, setting standards, creating incentives for change, and so forth. But a challenge, I think, has been that, um, that to my knowledge, and it, maybe I'm wrong, maybe there's been a couple or one or two, but the, the use or of the new tax credit has been negligible. And, and that, so it's a good idea, but it hasn't happened that anyone has actually started a new urban farm. There are still an existing number of urban farms. As a second case example, um, an example of this processing, I, would, I decided to share the Philadelphia he Healthy Vending Machine um, uh, legislation where the city of, of Philadelphia implemented healthy vending machine standards. And this, I know, is being considered in a lot of government offices in different settings. And their standards include things such as that about two-thirds of the items had to meet healthy nutrition standards. It, it, it imposed or implied smaller portion sizes for sugary drinks, so it was changing, again, the, the, the form or the format of the foods that were presented. There was prominent placement of healthy items, competitive pricing, and calorie labeling on the machine. So a combination of, inf of different types of intervention strategies. And this particular um, intervention saw an increase in sales of healthy beverages and an increase in the sales of healthier snacks over time. So that seems like it's doing something. Um, but I'll also say that a limitation or a challenge we need to think of is the potential or the limited reach of this type of intervention. Again, just working in a limited number of government sites. Um, uh, and uh, the, another challenge that's mentioned by the, um, the, the authors of this work was uh, fairly high levels of vendor resistance to changing the mix of foods that, that could be supplied. I think most of us are familiar with the Minneapolis Staple Foods Ordinance. To my knowledge, it's the first um, Staple Foods Ordinance of its kind, which set minimum standards for healthy foods sold in more than 200 licensed grocery stores. Um, it did not restrict sales of any, of any food items, but increased the supplies of about 10 categories of foods. 
and um, was quite specific about the amounts and the types of numbers of varieties of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, and so forth. Um, the ordinance went into effect in 2015, and there was a period uh, when the ordinance had gone into effect before enforcement actually began, and um, that's going to be um, that plays a role in terms of our thinking and our understanding of the the results that we've seen so far from this um, from this policy. But um, this included uh, educational work support for store owners, um, free mer merchandising and promotional supplies, um, creation of small scale fresh produce um, suppliers and, and access or to loans at least for um, refrigeration. And um, some of the early results, this is so, this is pre the enforcement phase, but post the, the passing of the ordinance, um, was improved stocking of healthy foods over time in smaller independently known retailers. So there's some stocking changes, but no uh, improvements were, have been observed yet in terms of healthfulness of consumer purchasing. And this seems to be largely due to problems with compliance. And so this whole compliance enforcement issue is something that we need, this is a challenge that we need to really consider when we're working with retailers and trying to food change the food environment in this way. The Berkeley soda tax is an example of the uh, a get strategy, I would say, and it would provided an excise tax on sugar sweetened beverage um, at the distributor level. This was roughly the amount, about a cent an ounce, and uh, targeted these types of, of, um, of beverages in the red, con in the red container. And it was implemented, as you know, in Berkeley, California, uh, with two comparison cities. And the goal was to examine the extent to which the tax was passed through in terms of pricing and changes in consumption. And um, they also tar uh, looked at media analysis. They did a media analysis. And so they found an impact on stocking and pricing in this particular um, policy. They found ch changes in stocking. They found that there was a pass-through of the price um, by um, the, the actual retailer. So that was all good news. Um, they found impacts on terms of uh, consumption. They saw increases in the consumption of water, decreases in the consumption of soda, and sports drinks, and so forth. So this was um, quite a positive example. They learned uh, a number of lessons from this experience that I think is relevant to our own work as we start thinking about um, working in these kinds of settings and doing local food policy. They learned the importance of coalition building. That's a theme I think we've heard um, from several of the speakers earlier today. They anticipated reaction of the industry and they, they actually, I think, probably in some ways used that anticipated reaction as part of their reaction, as part of the way they, they, they coped with that. And um, they also sought to determine and share impact on business owners. An example of the food preparation, this isn't a great example, but we did a trial here in Baltimore City with eight carryout restaurants in low-income areas where one component of the intervention was reducing um, the fattiness of certain cooking methods used for healthier foods. We did a lot of other things as well, including changing their menu boards and helping um, and, and promoting those foods. And we saw impact on the sales of healthier promoted items and increased revenue at these carryouts associated with the participation in the project and increased consumer purchase of healthier foods. And this, this ability, so if you're going to talk to a retailer and convince them to try something, really to them, as we all know, the bottom line is the bottom line, right? So they're going to be convinced, happy to support you. Well, at least it has to be revenue neutral, right? But, but even better is if you can show an increase or an improvement in revenue. And I know we, this may seem like an impossible challenge in many ways to do this, but it seems to at least have been possible in this particular pilot trial that we saw an increase in total revenue. So that's another a challenge for us, is to figure out how to make our findings convincing to, the, um, to, to retailers and the, and the people somewhat up the, the food chain. Um, something that I thought was, uh, that I was really excited about was that uh, Baltimore City expanded the healthy carryouts program to the public markets in the city as well. 
And there were a number of lessons learned from this experience other than what I mentioned, including things, the importance of rapport building and gradual phase changes in introduction of foods. As a final case example, um, the, the notion of surplus and waste and dealing with that, I, I decided to mention the Maryland Food Bank. Um, and you know, essentially the policy exists where if a retail food is no longer saleable but still safe for consumption, it can be donated as food banks, to food banks as salvage. And the Maryland Food Bank uh, operates a farm to food bank, um, uh, I guess, program or network where they work with partner farms and they are able to access excess produce or glean unharvested pro produce from, from those farms. And so um, they've been quite effective in, I would say, um, in their distribution of healthier foods through, through this means and a number of you know, millions of pounds of fresh produce that would have otherwise gone to waste has been collected and distributed through this program. So um, this is six quick examples of different policies operating in different sectors, although there's overlap, of approaches to, uh, to deal with or to work with different aspects of the food system. And I think that a theme that's run through this meeting so far is the importance of, well, combining these together. Can we work in multiple sectors at the same time with multiple strategies at the same time? And um, I'll just share one experience we had here in Baltimore very quickly doing this um, in a project called Be More Healthy Communities for Kids. And this graphic represents the different components of the intervention. We work with wholesalers, we work with stores. Stores includes both corner stores and carryouts. So the wholesalers who supply the corner stores and the carryouts, we worked at the caregiver level, we worked with the children through youth leaders at recreation centers, and there was a policy component as well. And um, these these little boxes are just listing some of the specific partners here in Baltimore City. It certainly wasn't all of the corner stores, there's 500 plus of them, but there were um, approximately uh, 25 corner stores and 13 carryouts. And we had more than 400 parents and children who were just part of the evaluation sample. We undoubtedly reached quite a bit more than that. And so if we were to utilize our picture, our rubric of different components of the food system, this is sort of my sense of what we've been able to, we're able to touch or in these components of approaches to address or work with the food system. Um, we are still analyzing these data, but one of the early papers did come out and we saw a significant impact on stocking. Um, we saw impacts on healthy food purchasing and consumption, um, some improvements in certain sectors of consumption. We're still yet um, doing some of the obesity, looking at the obesity data. So kind of concluding with some opportunities and challenges for modifying the local food system. Um, so first of all, uh, there was a question that came up earlier, where do we start, how do we start? And my own view is a place to start is with local food systems. There it's, uh, now I'm probably setting myself up here if I say it's a manageable thing to do, but um, I'm gonna still set myself up for, for critique by saying it's manageable to work in local food systems. It depends on, I suppose, the size of the locality. I'd also say that there, is actually quite a lot of emphasis in local food system policy on increasing supply and less on generating demand. Not that there isn't demand-related work going out there, SNAP-Ed is part of this, but I think we need to think about increasing demand at a very high scale or a large scale, De increasing demand with a much broader reach. Another challenge we face with local food system changes is that cities and towns and localities have borders. And it's possible to, possible to circumvent these borders, look, policies by crossing the border. An example is the bottle tax in Baltimore, where I hear time and again how um, small retailers will not, want to, not wanting to pay the higher prices imposed by the bottle tax by their local supplier will go right outside the Baltimore city boundaries and buy it in the county. So um, another opportunity is this that we need to consider is the importance of getting local health care data. Getting that kind of data is tough, and um, we need to do this. Uh, I think this creates the room for what we're seeing as a lot of university locality partnerships. I've already mentioned that the food delivery problem to small independent retail food stores is an issue, 
And just because you stock it doesn't mean they will come. So we have to work to increase demand as that as well. And then something that fits in with all of the system science modeling that we've been talking about today is this notion of the possibility of unexpected consequences. And how do we avoid this? Well, we avoid this by a lot of planning, a lot of talking with multiple stakeholders, of course residents, but also the people who provide these foods. A few future directions. So um, I've already mentioned that if we get stakeholders, coalitions, um, these will undoubtedly lead to systems interventions, and we need to bring those folks to the table. We want to work at multiple levels. We've already said that. But so far, I don't think we've done, except for in a few cases, a great job of working and intervening at all of these different levels. Some Part of this process, once we figured out how to do it, is the importance of setting standards for implementation of multi-level, multi-component interventions. And um, uh, so we need to think of standards for um, implementation, essentially process evaluation standards. Of course, we need planning tools. We need to do all the simulation modeling that has been described. And I think that digital solutions I'm on a little bit of a kick with this digital solutions lately, but um, maybe one way to address certain aspects of this problem. Right now, we're in the process of developing a, think of it like Uber Eats, but instead of going from your restaurant to your home, it's going from the wholesaler or the producer to the corner store, right? So they are able to, and, and think of it coupled with Groupon, a Groupon-like feature, which essentially allows collective purchasing to reduce the rate and increase the likelihood or the possibility that delivery could be covered with those costs. So I want to thank you for your time. I think I've run a little bit over. And we have time for questions. Oh, I'm perfect fly on time. Good. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Joel, for that presentation. I appreciated having some examples of things that may not necessarily have worked, and some that have. Um, I'm Tara Johnson. I work with the National Conference of State Legislatures. And I'm curious, with any of your examples, if you worked with, or if um, in Baltimore you worked with the state at all for these, if these were all simply local. Um, and if you didn't, were there any that you think are replicable at the state level? I'm going to, I would probably defer to Holly on that specific question. Um, the Holly is the food, the food policy director for Baltimore City. I can't say that I worked with directly with, with the states, um, with, with the state of Maryland on any of these projects, um, with the exception that um, certainly the fact if there was state support for things like an urban farm tax credit, or you know if there was a a, a you know, if, the, if these were incentivized or mentioned in some way, then there was, there was definitely interest and uh, increased possibilities of these coming through here in Baltimore City. So I guess in some ways the state has helped to create the context for some of these policies to be enacted. Yes. So in, in dealing with the wholesalers and uh, when the food goes from the wholesaler to the supermarket or the distributor or the corner store, you know, going in that direction. When it goes to the supermarket, the profit margin, how impactful is the profit margin for that supermarket or corner store in terms of um, delivering healthy foods versus, um, in terms of selling healthy foods versus selling not healthy foods. Is, is there, I guess what I'm trying to say is, does the profit margin of that particular supermarket um, impact what they sell? I think the answer would be 120% or <laughs> something, some very high, but I think the, the story differs if we're talking about a large supermarket chain with a lot of resources uh, they can afford to do 
what some of his times is called lost leaders. So they'll put, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll lose money on something to bring you into the store so they can sell you other stuff. Supermarkets can afford to do that, especially chain supermarkets. That is deeply contrasted with independently owned corner stores, which really, they're operating essentially by the skin of their teeth. They know their prices are higher than everybody else's. They, they, they accept that they have to do that because the price that they pay for those foods is higher. And so they can't afford loss leaders. They, they are very much tied to a very, um, to, to, to making a specific product. They can't afford to risk stocking foods that won't sell. And they've told me this time and time again. I'm not going to take that risk. It's, and even $50 worth of product is a big deal to them. So there's a very, you know, the constraints are very different for those two types of um, food sources. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Hi, Joel. Um, uh, Julia Wolfson at the University of Michigan. Um, so you mentioned the importance of consumer demand and accounting for demand and um, in sort of increasing consumer demand uh, at this local level. And you pointed to SnapEd as one of the examples of efforts to do that. And I'm wondering if you have other thoughts about um, efforts or from a, from a local perspective or maybe from a systems or a policy perspective, other ways to um, try and address the demand issue, mm -hmm. uh, accounting for the complexity of all of the factors that mm -hmm. go into how consumer demand is shaped for things like trying to shift towards healthier things. It's, it's, a, it's a really level. tough question to answer briefly. So, I mean, one could talk about addressing consumer demand through active things. These might be, you know, education and counseling sessions and, you know, um, and then you might consider more passive types of approaches. So you might consider shelf labeling, posters, you know, vi use of visual materials, maybe so some kinds of social media and so forth. And there's usually a trade-off in terms of reach. So this, the, the active approaches tend to be low reach or less broad reach, but maybe a little, but maybe more effective. And this has very high reach and will and will affect a lot, reach a lot more people, but won't necessarily be as effective. So I think that's thinking, figuring out the best combination of educational <coughs> strategies that might increase demand. That's part of it. Then you can think about ver a variety of different incentives. So you could think, and, and right now I'm talking about temporary incentives. So coupons, temporary price reductions, these sorts of things have the potential to like help people overcome some initial reluctance to try something. We talk about taste tests and that sort of thing as well, to try something new. Um, these are all approaches that maybe in combination would work. But part of it is going to be in, tr in terms of your selection of what are we going to promote? And, and you know, food is this giant thing. And I don't, you know, it's, there are many different foods that could be promoted. And so I think you have to consider focusing on certain foods within the food system that are going to be more effective. When I say effective, maybe are replacing a food that contributes a very high proportion of calories or sugar or fat to the diet, as opposed to other foods that may be nice, but maybe won't be as effective in making those changes. Sorry, do you have time for one more? Sure. Okay. Uh, thanks, Joel, for a nice presentation. Jean Clark from uh, Johns Hopkins School of Medicine across the street. Uh, I was really interested in the program you described about surplus food uh, d um, donations to the food bank. And you know, we've started to work with a local food bank in one of our local high schools. And they don't have refrigeration. In fact, they don't have electricity <coughs> in their food bank space. And so I'm wondering if you have information about how, uh, how much that has affected the ability to, to distribute fresh foods and vegetables, and whether you're aware of any ways, uh, efforts, monies, to try and enhance the capabilities of food banks to really uh, you know, receive, distribute, store healthy foods. Right, so um, I don't have the exact information that you, you're asking for. I would differentiate between food banks and food pantries. So food banks are, is, you know, like the wholesalers, right? They're the ones who collected it all together and they're the ones who established these relationships and, and so forth to glean food and that sort of thing. And then they redistribute to the food pantries. And so I think this, I think this differentiation is uh, important. 
So, um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know the answer to your original question. Sorry about that. Um, you know, how much the gleaning has and, and the, the surplus produce, I think that's probably worthy of studying. Maybe Ronnie Neff could be, help us yeah, with that. I think, my coach. I think Liz and Molly and I are heads too, so we need to Okay, you can answer that question next. Mm -hmm. Great. Joel, thanks Thank so you. Much. If you want to have a seat, I'm going to invite Liz and Holly and Anthony up to the floor here. And so I'll go ahead and um, you can each have a seat. Open the bottles of water. Make yourselves comfortable. Um, again, Holly Freestadt is the food policy director for Baltimore City. Anthony Francis was one in the inaugural class of the resident food equity advisors for Baltimore City. And Liz Marchetta is the food and nutrition services director for Baltimore City Schools. And so what I'm going I have three questions that I want you each to answer and take you know, about six minutes each. And then I have a lot of other questions, but we're gonna, before I get to anything else, we're gonna open it up for you all to ask questions as well. So the first, the questions are, tell us about your role. How has that role changed over time, and how has your perspective of your, your work changed over time? And then what non-food system issues impact your work? So Holly, why don't we start with you, and then we'll go down. Great. Uh, thanks, Joel, for setting the foundation for many of the topics I will be discussing today. Um, I'm Holly Freishaw, Food Policy Director for Baltimore City. I have been in this position for eight years. Um, when I first got here, I'm the first Food Policy Director in the city, um, one of the first in the country. Now there's around 22 of us around the country. We do see uh, the role of city government and food policy is changing um, and growing over time. Um, so as the food policy director, um, really when I see what my role is, it is to build capacity and maximize the amount of times government, really government, thinks about food. Um, one of the things I've noticed is food's everywhere, but yet we don't plan and create policy on food. Um, and so one of the things I seem to be doing quite a bit of is talking about how is different agencies working on food. So eight years ago, one of the very first things I did when I got to the city was saying, okay, I'm part time, I have limited resources and funding at that moment in time, um, how do I maximize this? So we created the Baltimore Food Policy Initiative. Um, intergovernmental collaboration um, with four key, three key agencies, Office of Sustainability, Department of Planning, sorry, four, Health Department and the Baltimore Development Corporation. We provide technical assistance to 12 other agencies in city government. So one is what is government's role? How can we do it better? How do we maximize who's already there on the ground working on food issues? Um, another piece is understanding what is the role of all our partners in collaboration. So we created Food PAC, our Food Policy Action Coalition. Um, it started really from the task force, the Food Policy Task Force, and it was 18 stakeholders at the time. Now I think there's over 60. Um, and anyone who wants to come whenever you want to come. Um, and it's really about building a social network, increasing knowledge, and, a, and to at least air and discuss policies from state, federal, and city levels. Um, and then and the other piece, which I'm not going to say too much about, is around the resident food equity advisors. How does a resident's voice have power to influence policy? Um, and that's something that we created last year, um, really looking at the role of residents by council district. Um, going into what is our key goal here? and how has that changed over time? So when I first got here eight years ago, I would have said to improve health outcomes um, by increasing access to healthy, affordable food in Baltimore City's food deserts. That's eight years ago. Now I will say um, how to improve, how to address health, economic, and environmental disparities in Baltimore City's healthy food priority areas. So food deserts changed to healthy food priority areas. Um, we have gone way beyond just the narrow focus of health outcomes um, to health, economic, and environmental disparities and what is the role that food has. Um, another piece is how I talk about what government does. I was initially saying it was really about how we collaborate, but what I've realized more recently than not is that what my job as food policy director is really I am a consultant. I am providing technical assistance to every agency in the city on food. And if they're not doing food, they probably are but don't know they are. 
They don't know that their, their transportation policy is impacting access to supermarkets. But pretty much food is intersecting in all aspects of our city. And my job is to provide support to those agencies who are already on the ground working with community. Um, so that's one side of it. The other side is we have the, I'm in the Department of Planning. We have many comp planners, community planners. How are they talking about food? Um, another piece of what has changed over time is data. How do we frame and talk about data? So we've been working with Hopkins since I've gotten here. Pretty much they are the foundation to the work that we do on food environment mapping. Um, the way we map or the way that I talk about mapping has changed. So at first we were writing the reports together. They were actually shorter. <laughs> and over time they have gotten more complex because the system is complex and we need to talk about it. Um, in this release of this new um, report of 2018, um, we saw a big change of how city government and what our role is with this data. Um, so we created these briefs, a city brief, 14 council district briefs, and state legislative briefs that talks about the food environment specifically on a map, the food retail, nutrition assistance, and urban agriculture. I need to make sure every elected understands the full spectrum of the food system because each one is going to have their own interest. I'm never trying to convert or make someone do something they don't want to do. Food fits everywhere. So if they want to talk about nutrition assistance, OK. Let's talk about nutrition assistance. If it's food retail and corner stores, OK, let's talk about that. And so when we're talking about our information, I want to make it accessible so that we can access um, policy in multiple arenas. Um, one other component I want to talk about is also what has changed our content area. So when I first got here, it was really about more, we wanted to do policy, but it was projects, right? It was how to get double incentive dollars into farmers markets. It was how to get healthier food into public markets. Um, and it was healthy carryouts in public markets. And now we have really changed that tack. We have talked about food resiliency in the city. We have an urban ag plan. Um, our Urban Ag Plan specifically talks about underserved communities and socially disadvantaged communities getting priorities in agriculture. Um, and so the work that we do really depends on what we're facing at that time. We have an entire emergency operation procedures on food as a result of the uprising and then Jonas. So there's work that we do that we did not know we were going to do because we didn't know the issue was going to arise. And our job is to address them as they arise. Um, talking a little bit about city, what we know about my role in the city is that cities can be very effective in addressing local food policies. And the way we do that is also, to answer your question on the state, I work very closely with the state. Please look at the state legislative um, briefs that we just created. Um, they're brand new. And I just briefed um, the Baltimore delegation two weeks ago on their food environment briefs that they were thrilled to have for the first time ever. Um, but a lot of our policies start with the state. So I needed state enabling legislation for a grocery incentive tax credit that we put in place in 2015 that then resulted um, in the opening of a supermarket. The urban ag tax credit, we needed to go to the state first to get state enabling legislation in order to do our city policies. Um, so we work very closely with the state. Um, I'm putting out something out there. I won't have time to talk, but then if you want me to tell you more, ask a question. Um, working with the United States Conference of the Mayors um, with a mayor's food policy task force, and we have 22 cities. Um, who are working on local food policies similar to myself, and we meet monthly, and then um, or we talk monthly, and we meet twice a year, and then we also are working with the uh, Milan Urban Food Policy Pact. Oh, excuse me, that's my timer going off. Um, which is really looking at what is the international commitment to local foods. Um, and we have 170 cities around the world who are addressing the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact from a local governance perspective. Great. All right, that's all. Thanks, Holly. Um, and then we're going to hear from Anthony Francis. And Anthony, if you also want to talk about not only being a resident food equity advisor, about your um, nonprofit uh, United Urban Roots, that would be great, too. Sure. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Can you move the mic closer to your mouth? Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Anthony Francis. Uh, I guess I will start off by saying that this is uh, very personal for me. Um, a little bit of my story. I grew up in uh, Columbia, Maryland, Howard County. Graduated from Wild Lake High School. Um, I moved to Baltimore about 10 years ago, Harlem Park, um, which you guys may know is not the best of neighborhoods. So I call myself a human social experiment because <laughs> I've seen both aspects of life. Um, what I will say is that I moved to Harlem Park and fell in love with the city and the people who live there. Um, 
what made me sad was to see the kids that I lived across the street from um, going to school, I mean, going to the corner stores and pretty much having access to chips and soda and that's it. Um, and really not being educated on um, what healthy food and really where it, where it comes from. Um, it also made me sad to walk and see uh, blighted lots and places that even if we wanted to grow healthy food, we wouldn't have the, uh, the land to do so. So, uh, you know, after living there for a while, getting my car stolen and having to personally walk to the grocery store a mile and a half, I decided to do something about it. And um, I started with uh, cleaning up some lots. Um, that's how United Urban Roots started. We wanted to combine people with like ideas, farmers, people who were cleaning the community up and bring them all together to make one big impactful uh, difference because one of the main issues I see is that there are a lot of small places and small uh, organizations that are trying to do positive things, but none of these organizations, at least in my neighborhood, really communicate with each other. So that is our focus. Um, and we also want to educate the kids and adults in our neighborhood about where healthy food comes from. Because um, this past year, we grew some vegetables. Um, the neighborhood has taken a liking to um, the gardens that we have started, and they're very interested in knowing um, what we're growing. But um, one of the things that uh, baffled me was I had a, a little girl come to the garden last year, and she wanted to play store and act like she was purchasing things. But she kept running behind the fence every time she wanted to purchase something. At first, it confused me. And then I thought about it, and I was like, this, this little girl has never been able to purchase her food not from behind the wall. So every time she went to purchase her food, she would run behind the fence and grab the fence. So I'm like, Jesus, you know, uh, <laughs> something has to be done about this. Um, so I guess um, that's why I joined the food uh, advisory, equity advisor, and became uh, one of those because they were putting a group of people together to make an impactful difference, who cared about community, who wanted to see some policy changes to better the community. And, um, and personally, again, uh, Talking about the corner stores is one of my biggest issues is how do we get um, these corner stores to take more responsibility for what they serve? Um, and again, I shouldn't have to wait in line behind the owner of the corner store in giant food, who is then gonna sell that same milk to me at $2 higher than what it is in the grocery store. So I appreciate seeing some of the centers that you guys are putting forth, um, and again, um, did, I, did I answer everything? <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah, that's, that's mainly what I want to do. And again, I just, biggest thing is educating the children um, and some of the adults. I have a 56-year-old guy in my garden last year who didn't understand that a cucumber came off a vine and was baffled by it. So again, I think it starts with, um, we make an impactful difference by putting posters up and, and so that the kids can see where healthy food comes from. Also, um, like the gentleman said earlier, um, on the ground level, we have to start hitting these community associations and um, explaining um, the impact that these unhealthy foods have on their children. Thank you. Thanks, Anthony. And Liz? Hi, my name is Elizabeth Marquetta. Um, I moved to Baltimore about 10 years ago, um, actually to come to Hopkins. I did my master's in public health and my MBA here. I fell in love with Baltimore. Um, my mother was born in West Baltimore. Um, and I have been here ever since. Um, I've worked with the school district since 2011, um, and right now I run the Baltimore City Food and Nutrition Services Department. Uh, we have 182 schools throughout Baltimore City. Uh, we serve breakfast, lunch, after school snack, and supper. Uh, we have a fresh fruit and vegetable program that's in over 100 schools that provides fresh fruits and vegetables outside of the cafeteria setting. And we do work with the food bank on school food pantries. So whoever had that question, I'd like to talk to you about the equipment afterwards. Um, we serve over 100,000 meals a day uh, throughout Baltimore City. Um, and that is over 15 million meals over the course of a school year. Um, we have over 750 staff who are largely residents of Baltimore City um, and have graduated from Baltimore City Public Schools. And uh, at one point, uh, many years ago, I thought about medical school. Um, and I would say the biggest thing that has changed in my perspective in my uh, job and working with Baltimore City Public Schools is realizing that our cafeteria managers have a 
greater power uh, than the children's pediatricians um, in impacting uh, you know, the supply of food that is out there um, and how it is presented and making it attractive to students and generating you know, a lifelong demand uh, amongst our students uh, for healthier food options. Um, you know, certainly there's a lot to be said for improvements that could be made to USDA's uh, school lunch program. I think of it from a relative perspective. Um, I begged my parents for Lunchables as a child, um, and now I see and disgust when they're on the cafeteria tables, um, but I also see that they've gone from $4 a pop down to $1 um, at Walmart. So, uh, you know, there's a lot to be said around there. Um, but we have, you know, terrific staff and, you know, we have focused a lot on the quality of the actual meals that we're serving. Um, you know, most significantly with our department, you know, I came in after USDA mandated that children, um, in order to receive a school lunch and for us to be reimbursed the roughly $3 per meal that we get, um, that students, we have to offer them a fruit, vegetable, uh, protein, dairy uh, and whole grain option um, and starting you know, in 2012 requiring that students have to take a fruit or vegetable. So we put a big emphasis for several years on uh, making that work, um, making the produce um, and fruit and vegetable options attractive to students so that they weren't just taking it as a matter of compliance with USDA but that they were actually going to eat it and not throw it out in the trash. Um, and I will say that children are just like adults. Um, they will eat what is easy, um, convenient, um, and a default for them. So it was glad to see that the oranges at lunch were sliced um, because adults will not eat them if you serve a whole orange. Um, children are just the same. So, you know, simple things like making sure that we slice our oranges has a huge impact on whether children are actually going to eat them or not. Um, we do offer unlimited fresh fruits and vegetables to our students, and we offer salad every day at lunch, uh, and we do not offer juice as a fruit component. Um, so those are some of the things that we've really done around fresh produce. And I saw that, um, I think there is someone from Coastal who will be speaking, um, and I will mention that our contract for uh, produce has gone from under $2 million a year to over $5 million a year um, in the past five years. So, you know, the demand is certainly, you know, students are eating their fresh fruits and vegetables, and we have looked at plate waste um, of us compared to other districts. Um, and again, a lot of it has to do with the individual line and how it's set up, um, where it is located on the line, um, and the attraction of it. You know, certainly um, students like adults get tired of a salad bar. Um, so, you know, making people uh, dress up their sandwiches, um, you know, color um, and making things look really palatable so that people actually uh, want to eat them and do. Um, we have a $49 million budget um, and you know, like I said, we get roughly $3 per meal. Uh, we spend about $15 million on salaries, about $8 million on benefits, um, and $22 million annually on food. Um, so when we look at you know, how we run our programs, it's not just about the food that's on that plate. Um, it is a little bit about the plate that we serve it on and we're actually transitioning away from styrofoam um, trays this year to compostable tray options. Um, and that is one thing you know, that's only really been made possible by large school districts and into institutional food suppliers making these shifts and helping to bring down the price of um, compostable tray options for districts. Um, the other thing I will say is, you know, we have over 750 staff members and they are our biggest asset. Um, and training beyond uh, USDA compliance has been a huge thing for us. Um, so you certainly can't be in Baltimore City and not have conversations about crime. Um, but talking about, you know, the cafeterias, the school's largest classroom, um, that's the area where you crowd the most people together at once, and if people are hangry, you know, issues can come up. Um, issues come up when you have, you know, as many people as we do. So looking at things like stress management, conflict management, uh, trauma-informed care, and how we relate to each other and creating, you know, nice environments for children to eat in. Um, not having silent feeding, making sure kids have recess before lunch so that they're eating more of what's on their plate. Uh, those are big things for us. Um, so I think that's pretty much it. Great. Um, Thanks, Liz. Okay. Yeah. Now it's questions from the audience. I have more questions if you guys don't. More of it? 
Okay, so one of my questions is going to be, since I don't, do you see any hands? No? Um, do you, in, in your work, do you, any of you see a leverage point or leverage points where you think, if we did this, this could yield a potentially really big, or not really big, let's say a modest impact, but it could have a ripple effect. Sometimes we don't know what those effects are going to be, and I'm just curious when you sort of look at what you're doing, where do you see that there are some leverage points? Um, personally, the, uh, the score system, as far as uh, uh, the corner stores, can you move help. the mic over? I'm sorry. The there. score system, um, as far as corner stores being accountable for holding a certain amount of produce, a um, certain amount of healthy uh, alternatives besides soda, I would love to see implemented. I think that would have a direct impact because, again, um, a, another major concern of mine is, again, a, a lack of racial equality as far as equity goes in the neighborhood. Again, I. Um, there are a lot of corner stores in my neighborhood. None of them are owned by people who live there. None of them. Um, none of them look like me. I'm barely speaking the English. Um, so I would like to see some incentives um, and you know, some breaks put in place for people that have done business in the neighborhood and who have helped kept the bones together. And also keep some of the people who are already doing business in the corner stores responsible for some of the um, business practices, and practices that they are uh, doing. Great. So I'll feed off of that. Um, so the resident food equity advisors um, theme for this year, and they will be starting in March, um, and it's 14 resident food equity advisors. The theme is corner and convenience stores, and it's a policy agenda specifically for that. So it's looking at models like Minneapolis. It's looking at zoning like Harford. Um, it is looking at permits and different types of requirements. And also, you have to understand um, cultural identity and differences, right? So well, one of the whole components that we'll be talking about is the relationship between store owners and residents and how do we address that, you know, between the Asian community and the black community um, and the growing community of the Latinx community owning stores and how does culture have a role in our corner store? So I think one of our leverage points that we're sitting on right now is based off of the research from Joel and nationally on corner stores, our food environment mapping. Um, we are at a leverage point. Um, and why we do our mapping first, so that we kind of have the political willpower when the time comes um, to be able to address these issues. Um, on another piece on leverage point, that I want to, I look at it a little differently. When I think about leverage points, I think about timing. That's the first thing that goes to my mind a hundred times over. Um, so it's having a laundry list of policies because it's all about when that time is right. Mm -hmm. And I don't control that timing, but I better be ready for when that timing turns. Um, so I feel like the leverage point we have is watching time, watching what the culture, what is the agenda that we're seeing happening, whether it's national, city, or state, um, and being able to maneuver and to leverage the resources we have when that time is appropriate. Okay. Thanks. So um, everyone knows that I'm big into corner stores, um, and I certainly agree that they are a definite target for intervention and improvement in Baltimore City. They're ubiquitous. They're especially located in low-income areas of the city. Um, they're open five to seven days a week, 12 plus hours a day. They're there. And um, we should work with those. But I did want to introduce um, another venue, which would be carryouts. And um, I think, so, so we did some early studies and found that more than half the calories consumed in the community are coming from prepared food sources. Um, and uh, what is the common prepared food source? Well, we did some ground truthing and we found in the low income areas of Baltimore, about 72% of the prepared food sources are carryouts. About 15% are corner stores with carryouts. And like 10% perhaps are fast food restaurants, maybe 5% are some other kind of sit down restaurant. So carryouts, are a factor. And if they're getting, people are getting more than half their calories from prepared food sources, I think there's a lot that could be done in that, in that particular venue. And I know I don't want to give up and say that people can, re can prepare their own food at home using things they buy at food stores, but, but at, there's also a reality that more and more, and my family included, do a lot of eating of prepared food that we get from outside the household. So I think there's something that could be done there as well. Keith. 
Oh, sorry, Keisha, you go and then Keith. Thank you, Anne. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Keisha Pollock-Porter. I'm here at, on faculty at the school, and I was curious to hear particularly from Liz, Anthony, and Holly uh, in a room of researchers if there is a sort of research question you wish that you had the answer to that could better inform the work you're doing or feel like it can make you more impactful in terms of the reach. Um, just curious to hear if you have any burning questions you'd like people here to think about. Oh yes, I'll go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the list started really fast, so I, I'll stop at three. Um, okay. Consumer data. So I am, I'm reading all the data I have on SNAP consumption patterns in the country. I'm reading all the national data I can see on consumer. We don't have Baltimore specific data on consumer. Like we're doing a really good job on the food environment, um, but if we were able to have a strong consumer data set of you know, food choices, food preferences, anything related to health, um, and diet, that would be a great data set, Baltimore specific, that's one. Um, two is in the same light that we have done the food environment mapping for really food retail nutrition assistance in urban agriculture. Um, we've done a little bit of mapping, but I think we continue to do more around carryouts and fast food and prepared food sources. I would love to see in the same way that we have our food environment map that we add a whole data layer set into it. Um, on carryouts. Those were the, I mean, those are the two that I would say comes, oh, and the third was cost. This is a huge one. Um, we always hear from residents, you know, that the cost of food in, as I say, a corner store is more than in a supermarket, or the cost here is more than that, but we don't have any really large data set on, we have best practices, we have case studies, but we don't have large data sets on the cost of food in Baltimore and how it varies by store type. All right. Great. Okay, Anthony and Liz, research ideas. Um, I guess first thing that comes to mind is uh, there's not already some data that I don't know about is um, what um, educational programs out there, what are the kids still learning? Because I remember when I was still in school, it was like, here's the pyramid and you're done. That's all we learned. <laughs> you know, we didn't really learn about it. I mean, vegetables are healthy, but we never really learned the science of it, why they're healthy, where chlorophyll is, how things grow, how you grow them, how they am environment impacts those vegetables. So I would like to see data on um, the knowledge that these kids are giving on what foods they're putting in their body besides uh, yeah, uh, the norm. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Liz, anything? I'm sure there's probably people in this room that are doing research on the school lunch program um, because it's across the country and it's big. Um, I'm also interested in kind of educational programs that can be used, because I think about that a lot. It's outside of our purview, um, but I do think of us you know, as a big classroom. Um, I got home ec education. I was talking to someone about this over lunch, um, but we learned funnel cake and pizza bagels. Um, so, you know, I, and, and I don't think that those still exist or support in that same way. Um, we are certainly interested in more in exposure, exposing uh, students and our staff um, to the supply chain and looking at food system education, going to visit our processors and distributors um, and having people understand more about that. Um, so looking into some of the new you know, <coughs> curricular components around that and how you know, the benefits of working with uh, staff in the food chain um, is really interesting to me. I'm also interested in um, water. Um, and in the context of Baltimore City and certainly many other urban environments where we talk about lead and water, um, I think that that is one area where uh, when, you, when we talk about, you know, what's the, what's the gauge point for when you get involved with legal action in something and talking about soda being a poison, right? Um, you know, wh where, where does that line lie? Where do we talk about responsibility as a government when, you know, we talk about lead and water um, versus uh, allowing you know, sodas in schools um, and, and what kids bringing around and where's the relative risk um, around that because you know, that to me is an issue that is really important now and has kind of come up in the past couple of years and certainly our instinct is to back away um, when, when we talk about lead and water but there is a real kind of trade off there when you talk about ta the, the discourse of talking about water being unsafe um, you know, and what are the other options? What, what are students getting? And, what, you know, what is the impact of that? Great, thanks. And then I'm gonna, last question for Keith. 
Thank you. Uh, my name is Keith West. I direct the program in human nutrition. Uh, this question will, uh, here at Hopkins, and this question will not be a surprise to Joel, but it's for Holly. Um, when I lived on Castle Street for seven years, uh, just two blocks away, I would buy virtually all of my fruits and vegetables from a uh in Baltimore. There is a history of, of mobile food carts in this city that is perhaps unique to Baltimore in many ways. Would you see a history or a future, rather, for um, uh, bringing back a horseless a rubber to uh, penetrate the, uh, the, the uh, markets in Baltimore, that the virtual markets, I guess, right now, that don't have the kinds of foods that are needed uh, as a way to uh, reintroduce fruits and vegetables into the city? Great. Thanks for the question. Um, so just so you know, um, the a rubber history um, so I think it was around 10 years ago, we saw a big decline in a robbers due to many different circumstances. Um, and what we did see, and I don't think it's really discussed that much, is many of those a robbers did go to truck-based. Um, so they are still on the streets using their trucks and selling out of their back of their trucks. Um, so we are seeing one is we did see some transition to that. a robbers is our food culture. Um, and it is an African-American food culture in our city. And trying to figure out a way that it can come back to Baltimore um, with any of the issues, health issues, sanitation issues, economic issues, um, to be addressed and to be supported. Um, and this is actually something that has come up with the resident food equity advisors multiple times last year. And this year, we're going to really have a conversation with the resident equity advisors on a wrapping specifically. And then also, I think there needs to be this moment in time um, of this process of healing around A-Rabbing. Um, because it was a strong culture, then it was very abrupt, and you know, to many um, black residents in the city, it felt very unfair, unjust, that the A-Rabbers just disappeared overnight to horses being taken, and many other factors. Um, in all honesty, I don't understand and know a lot of those factors. They're outside of my purview. Um, and how, do, how does the city heal from the A-Rabbing process and how does it come back? And we're seeing some more A-Rabbing license coming in. Um, and I think one thing to understand around A-Rabbing, do you guys know what A-Rabbing is? Get a hands, okay. What I did not, uh, A-Rabbers is um, horse-drawn um, produce carts rolling through the city and it's always been in limited resource areas in our city. Um, and they go to Jessup, to our terminal to get the food and come back and then they A-Rab. What I didn't understand until relatively recently is that the person who goes buys the food from Jessup loads up the carts of the a rabbers and then an A-rabber then rents the cart for the day. Um, so it's not always the same people. So it could be any different one who has an a rabbers license. Um, and so I think that we are going to see some kind of rendition of that over time. Um, but we also have like the Real Food Farm mobile truck, which is not the same. It is not African American. It is a nonprofit. It's, you know, farm-based product. But we are seeing trucks coming through the city um, doing um, double incentive dollars and selling produce as well. Great. Please uh, join me in thanking our panel today. So we're supposed to have a half hour break, but let's take, let's say till 20 after. Does that sound good? So that'll be 25 minutes. And I'm gonna beg people to please spend a minute or two writing something on the notes about what sort of promising policies, programs, or interventions, or questions you wanna have answered.